Physics 272. Last time, last time we looked at uh, the transient response when connecting a circuit. We looked at how long until steady state is reached. And we talked about Kirchhoff's voltage loop law. The voltage loop law is simply that if I go around a closed loop in a circuit, when I get back to the exact same spot in the circuit, I have to come back to the same voltage. In the same way as if I hike anywhere around the Earth and I come back to my starting point, I'm at the same elevation. So the voltage height analogy really serves you well there. Now, one of the things that we talked about last time was this idea that I go to a light switch. This isn't a very obvious one. But you flick a light switch, and immediately the lights come on. And we calculated what immediately is. We said immediately is about a nanosecond. So it takes about a nanosecond between when I flip a switch and the lights actually come on. Because all over the circuit, what's going on is that the information from having flipped the switch travels at the speed of light. Bam, all around the circuit, travels all, all over the circuit. And then uh, once that information has gotten everywhere, then there's a current flowing everywhere in the circuit. We said if we looked at it in a different way, though, and if we said, well, when I flip the switch, how long does it take an electron from the switch to travel up into the light? Okay. Now, technically, when you're flipping a switch on the wall, it's AC alternating current. So all that happens is that electrons jiggle back and forth, and they don't ever travel up there. But if we pretended that this was a DC circuit, and I flip the switch, DC meaning direct current, and the current's only traveling one direction as though we had a big battery attached to it. So in that case, if I flip the switch, it would take about how long for the electron to get up there? Do you remember? Like a day, right? So it would take about a day for an electron from the switch to travel all the way up to the light. So we had this kind of a paradox to resolve. And we said, OK, the electrons are moving really slowly somehow, right? They go at about 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. And we said the situation is very much like, like this situation. This is. I didn't have the video clip last time. I just wanted to show it to you. So this is Dr. Nefario. If you've watched Despicable Me, you know the story is about Gru, and his head scientist is Dr. Nefario. So Dr. Nefario has decided to take a job elsewhere. He's getting his big send-off from all the minions. And he's going to make his farewell. That's what he just said. Yeah, maybe I watched it a few times last night. Anyway, so, so he's making his little getaway there. He's, he's getting away, but he's kind of slow, all right? So the idea is the same about how the electrons travel inside of a circuit, all right? They're traveling at 10 to the minus 5 meters per second. So that takes about a day for an electron from a switch to get to the actual light bulb that, that, um, that's being lit up. So. From our perspective, these electrons move very slowly. But at the same time, from their perspective, right, we saw that they're passing about 100,000 atoms per second. So from their perspective, they're working pretty darn hard. Thank you very much. But also, in any hunk of matter you can hold in your hands, there's about a mole or maybe 10 moles in your hand that you can hold. And a mole is about 10 to the 23 particles. Okay, And when I have a hunk of metal, each atom gives us about one electron to the electron C. So in a hunk of metal that I can hold in my hand, this is not metal, there we go, wire. In a hunk of wire that I can hold in my hand, there's about 10 to the 23 electrons in the electron C. That's a lot. So even though they're moving slowly, when they all move together, that's actually quite a bit of current. So we have to think about then that, that even though they're moving slowly, there's a lot of current. So I don't know, picture 10 to the 23 Dr. Nefario's driving by very slowly, it would be a lot of Dr. Nefario current. I think I just made that up. Possibly the first physics class in the world to discuss Dr. Nefario current. You heard it here. OK. All right. There we go. Today, we're going to get into capacitors. Lots and lots of capacitors. So lots of capacitors today. And we want to think about what happens. Um, I want to think first about what happens when we first connect the circuit. So this is something we discussed last time. 
is, is right out of lecture 15, last lecture, we talked about what does the surface charge on the circuit look like in that moment right before you connect things up. So if I've connected wires to a battery and I'm about to flip a switch or connect these guys together, right before I connect it, there's still no current flowing, which means there's no net electric field inside the wires. So we said that there must be surface charges all in the surface of the wires. And in fact, right here at the, at the very gap itself, on the gap face, there's also charge there blocking the flow of current. And so think about this, okay? Think about the charge that's actually on the faces of the gap. And what I want to do next is think about what happens um, if we um, make this face a little bit larger. So this is instantaneous, okay? So if I instantaneously take the very end of those wires and give them a little bit more surface area, all right, I didn't let the charges rearrange yet, but what are the charges going to want to do in order to maintain equilibrium here? I just, all I have right now is the same surface charge as before, but I just instantaneously, bam, increase the surface area at the end of these wires. Yeah, I'm going to have to build up more charge, right? So I have more surface area here. I have to build up more charge. So that's what's going to happen here in the next one. So we're thinking about this situation where now we have, <coughs> I've added surface area to the end of the wires. And now I'm going to have to have more surface charge gather out there on this larger surface area in order to maintain that equilibrium. So bigger gap charge for the larger area at the gap. And here I have an even larger area forming at the gap. And in that case, I'm going to have to have an even bigger gap charge. So I've got the Qs getting larger and larger here. This thing right here, I just turned it into a capacitor, right? I went from something you already know, which is what the charges look like right before I connect a circuit, okay, so when it's in equilibrium, to this is actually now a capacitor in equilibrium, okay, in, in this case. So I have a large charge that'll, that'll gather up there. So that's basically the function of a capacitor in a circuit. It's going to either have charge build up on it, or then we might use that stored charge, which is a way to store energy. We might use that stored charge then to drive something else later. So this is just a bit about capacitor construction. They're kind of small. I have some up here, OK? So fit in the palm of your hand. Um, and if you open it up very carefully, don't hurt yourself. If you open it up, it'll look kind of like a bunch of things rolled together into a little cylinder. So the construction of them is that you have two metal foils, OK? And the metal foils don't touch. They have some plastic insulating material in between them. And then you curl that up. That's simply to get a larger surface area inside of a small circuit element. If we actually unfurled this thing and did it in the geometry that we tend to calculate, we're going to calculate the simple geometry of I have um, a disk with another disk, and they're a certain distance apart. And I'm going to you know, treat it that way then if I unfurled these capacitors here, they'd actually have a rather large surface area. So to pack them into a tiny circuit element, they have insulating material in between them that's curled up. So our approximation of that, which is a good approximation, but it's, it's an approximation, is that we will treat capacitors as two disks together, OK? And we'll neglect the fact that in a real circuit element, they actually um, have insulators around them, that, that, and then they're curled up into a tight little um, Wad, I guess you'd call it. So the circuit symbol looks like this. And we're thinking again of a particular distance between the metal plates, S, and a particular area of the, um, of the circuits themselves. Oh, sorry, of the um, plate, of the face plates. I, losing the words there, OK? So the area on the, um, on the capacitor itself. So I want to think first about charging a capacitor. But actually, it's much more fun if we just do the experiment here. I'm hooking things up so that I have a switch back here that's open. But when I, when I close this switch, what's going to happen is that I have batteries, and then a capacitor, and then a light bulb, and then it comes back to the batteries. So we'll see what happens when we flip the switch. The bulb lights up, but doesn't stay lit up. Okay, so. Something happened, but not for terribly long. Um, let me then rearrange this a little bit. OK, so now what I'm about to do is just put the light bulb in series with the capacitor. OK, something happened to the capacitor before. 
Well, something happened to the light bulb before. We'll watch what happens now. The light bulb's nice and bright, and then it dims out. So what, what we're doing in these situations is that um, initially there's no charge built up on the capacitor, all right? And then when I hook it up with the capacitor and then the light bulb and then the battery, the light bulb burns bright for a little bit. What's going on is that we're charging the capacitor, okay? So here's what's happening. We initially hook things up, we initially saw a bright light bulb, and then the light bulb got dimmer, and the light bulb got dimmer. So when we initially hook things up, uh, the battery starts driving a current in the circuit. The reason we have the light bulb there is to show you visually when there's a current there. So when there's a high current, the bulb is bright. As the current dwindles down to nothing, the bulb eventually goes out. So initially, we have um, current going in the circuit. The arrows here, the pink arrows, represent the magnitude of the electron current. If you want to think in terms of electron current, you'd think of electrons coming off the end of the battery, the, the negatively charged terminal, and going around the circuit. Now, what happens when these electrons get up here to the capacitor is that, yes, there's a current coming, but they kind of get stuck there, right? There's a gap. The electrons don't get to go across the gap. Um, not unless you drive too high of a voltage and you spark your capacitor, don't do that, okay? So um, the electrons show up to one face of the capacitor, to one plate of the capacitor, and it's kind of like, um, oh, yeah, um, yeah, Thanksgiving's coming up, so we're gonna have um, that, that shopping day around Thanksgiving. What is it, the set, there's a name for it. Thank you, Black Friday. Black Friday's coming up. This is the day when everyone piles outside of Best Buy like this, okay? So you have to imagine that these electrons coming up to one face of the, of the capacitor are kind of like all of us, 4 a.m. outside of Best Buy. We emerge from the parking lot as a current of people, and I guess I should go this direction. So we emerge out of the parking lot like a current of people, and we get up to the doors, and the doors are shut. Okay, so you pile up, right? Um, and so here, the electrons are piling up, and eventually there's enough of a pileup of electrons, okay? So eventually there's enough charge there that there's so many electrons that they are repelling the ones coming in, and the current has to stop eventually. So that's what's happening here. Another way to analyze it is to think about, not in the, uh, the case of charges, I prefer to think of this in terms of charges. Your book talks about it in terms of electric fields. They're totally equivalent, so think about it whichever way you like. I think of charges building up and then the charges repel each other, which is of course exactly what's going on. Your book points out that another way to analyze this is in terms of the fringe field that's coming off of the capacitor. Inside the capacitor there's a high electric field as the charges build up, but there's a little bit of electric field leaking out as well called the fringe field, and starting from the positive plate the electric field comes out and back around and comes back in towards the negative side. It's a small field, but it's there, right? And um, that small field is what's, what's um, contributing to uh, the net electric field being zero over here after you've charged the capacitor. So when, once you get to static equilibrium, it's that fringe field of the capacitor that's, that's um, adding up to the rest of the field inside the, the wire there to give you net zero electric field. Okay. All right, so that's charging it. This is a graph versus time of What's going on? So what we saw, and I'll just, <clears throat> right now I have a charged capacitor. Um, I'm actually going to have to discharge it before I can show you charging again. So, um, okay, so now we're discharging the capacitor as evidenced by the, the light bulb glowing and then kind of winking out. So there's no charge left on this capacitor. Um, I'll set up the case again where we're going to, to charge it, which is these graphs. So I haven't flipped the switch yet, but when I close this switch, that's going to be time equals zero in these graphs. So when I first flip the switch, there's no charge built up on the capacitor in, in, in that instant. Um, as we first flip it, charge starts to build up on the capacitor. The bulb is bright at first, and then it dims out. The bulb brightness is directly proportional to the current in the circuit. So I can equally well plot the current in the circuit over time. And what's going to happen is that as the charge builds up, the current stops flowing. Okay, so here we go. We initially get a bright bulb. 
initial brightness, and then it's eking out and eking out, and eventually, at long enough times, there's no brightness left to the bulb. And that happens when the capacitor gets saturated with charge. When the capacitor has built up all the charge it can take, everything has to stop moving, and, and everything actually, in this instance right now, it's actually back to equilibrium. E even though I have a battery in the circuit, it's equilibrium right now because nothing's flowing. So um, there we go. So why does the current ultimately stop flowing in the circuit? You can think of it either way you like. You can either think of, um, think of electrons coming to one plate on the capacitor and they pile up there. The charges pile up and repel each other and so they just can't come in anymore. Or you can think about the fringe field on the capacitor and the field due to the charges on the wire are such that the net electric field on the wire there is zero and that gives you the, the uh, zero current in the, in the final case. Okay, now discharging. All right, we've got our capacitor charged. Okay, I'm going to discharge the capacitor now. And what you'll be able to see is that the bulb will get bright at first, and then it's going to slowly wink out. So the capacitor, um, as it stores charge, it's storing energy, right? So we charged up the capacitor, it, got a, it saturated its charge, and it's actually storing energy there. Remember, we have discussed that inside of a capacitor, there's a, once you charge it up, there's a large electric field inside, and that that electric field inside actually is a, there's energy stored in that electric field. So then when we now use that capacitor that's charged to drive another circuit element, as we just did when we discharged the, the capacitor in order to drive the bulb, then we're taking that energy out of the capacitor, using it to run the light bulb. Okay? So it, a charged capacitor acts like a battery, just not a very good battery because it doesn't last very long. So here's what happened when we were discharging. When we initially hooked things up, the capacitor was full of charge, okay? and when we hooked things up, there was an immediately large electron current going through the circuit. Now, notice that there's an electron current coming off the negative terminal, so the negative side of the capacitor. That's, and then there's the same electron current going through the, bat, the um, light bulb. And then up here at the positively charged side, there's also electron current coming in. But there's none flowing through the gap. Okay, so the electron current here is just basically piling up and piling up until eventually we get less and less net charge here and then there's no more charge left eventually and then everything stops. So this is the situation that we just saw. So um, if now I want to graph everything versus time in the two cases. So on the left hand side I have charging, on the right hand side I have discharging. Okay, the left-hand side is we're charging things up. We saw that the, um, that the current is initially large. We saw that because the bulb was initially bright. So as we're charging things up, the bulb gets run, gets run for a while. Then as we discharge, something similar happens, okay, except that now we're leaking charge off. So let's just run it all again and compare it to those graphs. So first I'm going to charge. That's going to be this case. Okay, I hook it up, the bulb's on, and then the bulb dims, and the bulb dims, and the bulb dims. Okay, the brightness of the bulb is proportional to current. As that happened, we charged the capacitor. Once the capacitor got all the charge it could handle, everything pretty much quit. Now, think about the right-hand column. Now we're going to discharge the capacitor. Initially, the bulb is bright, which is the same as high current. And then we come along, come along, bulb is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And as that happens, we're just basically leaking charge off of the capacitor. Now, I bet some of you at least have watched Sesame Street. Yes? Okay. It's okay if you haven't watched it recently. I'm betting, though, that you watched it in your past when you were, when you were younger. There's this game they play on Sesame Street called One of These Things is Not Like the Other. There's a little song that's now an earworm stuck in your head. So here's Cookie Monster to help us out. One of these things is not like the other, okay. Wh which one's different? What now? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> the plate with three cookies is the one that's different. Good. I uh, probably owe you a cookie. <laughs> um, so in our graphs here, which is the graph that's not like the others? 
Okay, yeah, down here, the charging case. So the current did the same thing in both cases. The current just died out, okay? And the bulb brightness died out with time. In one case, in the charging case, we're building up charge with time, and in the discharging case, we're getting less and less charge with time. So um, yes, Cookie Monster has helped us solve both problems of which plate of cookies was different and which graph was different. So here's our different graph, okay? So it, it, it looks, it's, anyway. Yeah, cookies. It's all about cookies. All right. Now, here is a question. Um, you might wonder, OK, fine. I see it. I saw it in the circuit. I saw that after you've charged the capacitor, you can discharge the capacitor. But it's a little, you know, there's one more thing to take into account, right? We saw it happen, but at the same time, once I have all this charge built up in the capacitor, you might argue the following. You might argue that, look, there's a positive side and a negative side, and these guys attract each other. Okay? And that's right. Those positive and negative charges attract each other. But at the same time, there's, there's kind of two ways to think about, well, it's not just going to stay there because positive and negatives attract. right? We know that it's going to discharge. The charge is going to leak off. And one way to think about it is that, yes, these oppositely charged plates um, have the charges attracting each other, but like charges are repelling even more because each of these positive charges is much closer to the positive charges than it is to the negative charges. So once I hook things up to discharge, the positive charges um, really do repel each other, the negative charges really do repel each other, and then current starts flowing. Another way to think about it, they're equivalent, another way to think about it is that once we hook things up um, in the discharging case, the fringe field outside of the capacitor is not zero. There actually is a small fringe field out here, which is drawn in the green arrows, coming out of the positive plate and back into the negative plate. That's what drives the initial currents there. Actually, it's what drives the current the whole time during the discharging process. So it's, the fringe fields are small, but they are what drives things um, in these cases. Now, what happened if I tried to discharge? Let's say that I go to the infinite plate case. So I don't know if you can buy these at Radio Shack, but let's just pretend we had a capacitor with infinitely large plates. Okay? What happens to the fringe field if you have infinitely large plates? Okay, and the fringe field is that part of the field that's outside the capacitor. What's the magnitude of the fringe field if I have infinitely large plates? I heard it sort of. Zero. zero, yeah, the fringe field goes to zero. So if I actually had a really, really infinitely large capacitor, um, I couldn't discharge it by this method, right? Because there would be no fringe field out there to drive it. But not a problem for our finite size capacitors. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. All right, let's think about um, the effect of different different types of light bulbs in there. So let's say that I have two different light bulbs, one with a thin filament and one with a thick filament. Okay? Um, the thick filament means inside the light bulb I have a thicker wire, a thicker wire. Let them be made of the same material, but the thicker wire can carry more current. Okay? So if I have the thick filament, when I initially hook up this circuit to charge the capacitor, the thick filament allows more current through it. I'll initially see that it's a brighter bulb. Okay? Um, what I would see, though, if I, if I trade it out then, well, let's do the experiment again with a thin filament, it would, grow, it would glow um, not as bright. The thin filament bulb wouldn't be as bright. But what we'd see is that it would actually glow longer. It would take longer for that bulb to wink out. So altogether, each bulb would have had the same amount of energy passed through it, right? The one with a thick filament would have had a lot of energy passed through it first. It would have burned brightly and then winked out really fast. The one with the thin filament, filament would have had less um, brightness at first, but it would have lasted longer, okay? Taken longer for everything to charge up. So in, in both cases, though, the final state of the capacitor is the same. So what happens voltage-wise inside of this circuit as you, as you charge things, once I've gotten to the actual um, long time steady state situation where I've fully charged the capacitor, when the bulb is no longer um, lighting up, then there's no current through the bulb. If there's no current through the bulb, there's no voltage drop across the bulb. Okay? You following that? Right? If there's no voltage drop across the bulb, and I'm talking about the very long time case, then the entire voltage drop of the batteries is now across the capacitor. Okay? 
So in the long time case, the entire voltage drop is across here. And in both cases, the capacitor gets charged by the same amount. So that's, all that's to say is that when I've fully charged the capacitor, I've fully charged the capacitor. It doesn't matter how I did it, right? The capacitor has a certain capacity, a certain uh, amount of charge that it can hold on it, right? Capacitor comes from capacity, the capacity to hold charge. So a particular capacitor can hold so much charge, when it's filled up, it's filled up, okay? So the capacitor got charged the same amount in, in both cases, but the time that it takes to do it will depend on what else is in uh, the circuit. And actually, in the next lecture, we'll calculate how long that takes. So let me give you the de definition of capacitance. There it is, the yellow equation. Q equals C delta V. Um, so delta V here represents the voltage difference between these two plates on the capacitor. Once the capacitor is charged, we have plus Q on one plate, minus Q on the other. That's the Q in here. Delta V is the voltage difference between those plates. There's a particular electric field inside, and that's, you can use that electric field to tell you the voltage difference. And the proportionality constant is what we call C, the capacitance. And capacitance really comes from thinking about the capacity, right? It's the capacity of these plates to hold charge on them. And that's, that's where that comes from. Now, um, you know that on the exams, we give you the equations. You get an equation sheet. OK, no problem. You don't have to memorize this equation. But I think, first of all, it's such a short equation. You may as well. But um, I think your life will just be better if you have this in your head. I can't tell you how many times I've just needed to in the course of events. Just, oh yeah, Q is CV, and then that let me go on with my day. The same thing could happen to you. So you want to have this equation in your head. So here's my mnemonic device to help you remember it. Quacks are covered, okay, uh, by medical insurance. Um, quack is, uh, okay, if you're not a native English speaker, I don't know if they teach you this usage of the word quack. Um, quack is kind of a slang term for a medical doctor who's kind of crazy. So here's our crazy medical doctor, all right? Quacks are covered by medical insurance, Q, C, V, got it? Q equals C, V. Now you'll never forget the equation. And the next time you need the equation, it'll just be there in your head. Ah, Professor Carlson said quacks are covered, Q equals C, V, and you'll be able to finish the calculation. Lickety split. Good. Okay, so Q is C, V. You'll never forget it. OK, electric field in a capacitor, we can now calculate what the actual value is of the capacitance for um, a parallel plate capacitor with uh, what you've thought about so far is the, the disk shape, right? So if I think about um, the electric field inside the capacitor, I know that in the interior of the capacitor, the electric field is going to be Q over A over epsilon naught, OK? That's the electric field inside once we've charged up the capacitor. I can use that formula for the electric field to get the voltage across the capacitor. The voltage difference across the capacitor is going to be negative integrate E dot DL. Okay. In this case, that ends up being pretty simple because the electric field is constant in here. Okay. Think about going from the very inside of the plates, okay, uh, deep, deep in the interior here where we know exactly what the electric field is. And then in going from here to there, I'll integrate uh, the electric field over that distance. We know the electric field there is Q over A over epsilon naught, where Q is the charge on one plate and A is the area of the plate. Now with E being constant, I can just put that in directly and I get electric field times S. S is the distance I have to go from here to there. It's the separation between the plates. So then the voltage difference here is ES, the electric field we said is Q over A over epsilon naught. So the total voltage difference is Q over A, S over epsilon naught. And now I just want to rearrange this and solve for Q. That way I can go back to the Q equals CV, quacks are covered equation, and find out what the capacitance is for, um, for this case. So I solve for Q here, the epsilon naught comes up on this side, the A comes to the other side, the S comes to the other side. All together have Q is epsilon naught A delta V over S. And I compare back to the original definition of capacitance that Q is CV, and I see that this epsilon naught A over S must be the capacitance. So the capacitance then, C, is epsilon naught A over S. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. 
let me have two different capacitors that are initially uncharged. Okay, the difference between them is that they have a different surface area on their plates. So they have the same gap separation S, but they're going to have different radii for those disks that make up the plates of the capacitor. So the capacitors shown are initially uncharged. Let's connect them to identical circuits. And then after a certain amount of charging, 0.01 seconds, do we have the situation that A, the fringe field of each capacitor is the same, B, the fringe field of the smaller capacitor is greater, or C, the fringe field of the larger capacitor is greater. And here's the equation for fringe field. Um, it's Q over A over 2 epsilon naught times S over R. S is the separation. R is this radius of the plate. <laughs> you guys are fast. I heard the conversation. I'm still scribbling stuff when I hear the conversation uh, die down. So tell me, what are some of the things that we should take into account in this circuit? Yes. OK, so the fringe field is inversely proportional to A. All right. So we need, to, we need to worry about that, because if they have different, um, different radii here, then we have different uh, area that are there. All right. What else do we need to think about? OK, other, other things to consider here? Yep, it's true that um, if everything else is the same, then something that's got a particular area on the, on the plate then if I have a larger area, then I should have a smaller fringe field, right? We know that as the plates get larger, right, then I have um, smaller fringe fields that leak out. Awesome. What else do we need to think about? Yeah. OK. All right, so he's pointing out that we don't know what Q is because I didn't give you something that's the long time case. This is just somewhere during the charging process. And we've already seen that. Uh, well, we know that, that things can take different times to charge depending on what, you know, what kind of circuit you've got in there and also what the capacitance is. Let's just see if we can demonstrate that difference in charging time. Um, so I have an open circuit. I'm about to basically, when I close the circuit, I'm going to charge this capacitor. This is a 0.47 farad capacitor. Okay, so the bulb lights for a while. All right, and then it dims out. OK. Um, we can see that upon discharging, it takes about as long, right? However long it took to charge, it takes about as long to discharge. OK. All right. But now let's see what happens if I instead do the larger capacitor. I have here a one farad capacitor. Here you go, bigger. Um, Let's hook that guy up and see what happens. All right. So this can hold more charge, right? It's basically this guy has the larger surface area. OK, the bulb goes brighter at first. And then still glowing. OK, that took longer. So it's like you're saying there's something different here about the time scales as well. And then if I. Discharge this guy now. Doesn't quite reach. Come on. Yeah, OK. Um, there we go. So again, it got as bright as it did on charging, just like it should. But then it actually, since this guy's larger, can store more current. Well, not current. Since it stores more charge, it can drive current longer. And so it took a little longer for it to discharge. So we actually. Um, need more information to solve this problem, is what you guys just pointed out, is that we don't really know, without more information, how much charge is on these guys at any given instant. Because they're going to charge differently um, in different, uh, well, the different capacitors can hold different, different amounts of charge on them. So it's, it's not quite fair to assume that they have the same charge. So in fact, OK, we don't have enough information to answer this question yet. So you can put any question, any answer you like, and I'll give you full credit. Or you can put a protest vote of E, since it wasn't up there. Um, but basically, next, next lecture, we'll calculate that time constant. Okay? We'll calculate how long it takes these things to saturate. And then that'll give us the information we need to actually finish this problem. All right. So here, thinking about the effect then of capacitor size, the capacitor disk size, 
Um, thinking about the effective capacitor disk size, if we have this situation now where let's think about the case where we are going to charge the two capacitors, use two different capacitors but in the same circuit just like we did here, okay? After charging, which of these capacitors holds more charge? Okay, we saw that in the case of the larger, when we had the larger capacitor over here, not only did it make the bulb glow brighter at first, but then upon discharging, the bulb lasted longer as well. The larger capacitor, right, the larger surface area, can hold more charge, all right? So it, in fact, it has a higher uh, capacitance. You can see that the capacitance here depends on the area of the plate. And so when I, uh, as I'm charging the thing, the larger thing is the one that holds more charge, right? It has the higher capacitance. Then, if I now take the batteries out and run it in the opposite case for discharging, the larger capacitor runs the bulb longer. Just like we already saw with these guys, right? Okay, actually I've charged both of these guys now. There we go. This guy is the smaller capacitor. It runs the bulb for a certain amount of time. Okay. And then this guy is the larger capacitor, then it's running the bulb a lot longer. So basically this is to show you that once we're using it to discharge, the larger guy runs the bulb a lot longer. And the, the difference between these, okay, is that one of them has a lot larger surface area. So one of them has a larger A, which means it has a larger capacitance, and capacitance is about capacity to store charge in the capacitor. There's a lot of capacitance running around in there, okay? Now, I can also think in terms of disk separation. So if I go back to this equation here of the, the charge that ultimately gets stored on the capacitor then is epsilon naught A over S times the, the voltage difference. Uh, S here is the separation between these guys. So for a large separation versus a small separation, for the large separation, um, I'm actually going to have less charge get stored. We can think about it as, um, let me think of my hands as the, the ends of as the plates on the capacitor, right? So when I have the plates pretty far apart, but they're fully charged, they don't actually hold near as much charge as if I get them closer together and closer together and closer together. As they come closer, they can actually store a lot more charge on them. Um, and you can see that in this equation here with the, the S, basically. As S gets smaller, as S gets smaller, then Q gets larger as these guys get closer together. Do you have any questions about that? Yes. Um, how close can you get for the electron That's an excellent question. OK, so he's asking the question of, look, at some point, if I take this too far and I'm moving these plates together and together and together, at some point, well, first of all, I could just smash them together, right? And once I smash them together, then bam, it's, it's like a completed circuit, OK? But before that, there will be some time at which the electrons start jumping the gap, okay? So um, if you get to that situation, what's going on is that for the electrons to start jumping the gap, you need to exceed the breakdown voltage of air. So basically, um, if you exceed the, you know, air is an insulator, but if you put a large enough voltage on it, then you can start having electrons jump across that. So once you get to that place, the breakdown voltage of air, now you'll start sparking the capacitor. Generally not recommended, but that is basically what lightning is, right? So when lightning happens, then there's been enough, of, there's enough of a voltage between those two places that you've exceeded the breakdown voltage and um, well, things start moving, right? So yes, you, you can only do that so far. Good, excellent question. You move it close enough, move it close enough, move it close enough. At some point, if you exceed the breakdown voltage of air, then current will flow across the gap, right? Excellent question. All right, other, other questions so far? Good, all right. Now, I can think about um, what happens if I put two capacitors in the same circuit. Um, so, so here, for example, let's think about the exact same capacitor, um, identical capacitors, but I'm going to put two of them next to each other in the same way. So I'll just have everything else be the same, right? I have certain batteries here, I have a certain bulb up here, and now I'm going to charge capacitors, but I've got two of them in the same spot in the circuit. They're in parallel, all right, because they're, um, the current, it's, we think of it as like the current is traveling parallel uh, in, those, in those two cases. So in the initial moment, 
I have, since I have two capacitors instead of the one, right, um, these guys can hold more charge together, right? So having two capacitors in, in parallel effectively is like just increasing the surface area, right? It increases the amount of charge that you can hold on the capacitors. It increases the surface area total that you have. So it's very much just like um, doubling the, the surface area and basically doubling the capacitance. Um, here's a little bit of a conundrum to think of, though. Um, if I have this case, so now let's put the two capacitors in different places in the circuit. So again, identical capacitors. I have the same circuit elements just rearranged here. So now I have a battery here. And now I'm going to go from battery to capacitor to light bulb to capacitor to battery. Okay? And this is kind of an interesting situation in that technically that bulb is not directly connected to the batteries at all. Right? In the previous, previous case, at least the bulb had one direct connection to the batteries. Here I've got no direct connection. It's only what you would say capacitively coupled to to the batteries. So will this guy glow at all? Sure. What's going to happen is that as I have this thing hooked up, the electrons will flow out of the negative terminal of the battery and build up here. Okay, That then causes current to flow over on this side as well, and electrons will flow along this branch and come in here, and electrons will flow along this branch. They don't jump the gaps unless we exceed the breakdown voltage of air or in capa commercial capacitors, there'll be some breakdown voltage of the insulator in the gap. Um, which is different from the breakdown voltage of, of air. But basically, there'll be current flowing in every segment of the wire. It's just that each of these um, capacitor gaps is just like that crowd of people at the doors of Best Buy on whatever it was, Black Friday, right? So you just get the pileup, all right? So there's a pileup of electrons here, a pileup of electrons here. There's a lack of electrons here, which expose positive charge, and the same thing over here. So the current does flow. All right. It's just that the electrons never actually um, jump the gap. OK. All right. So in thinking about that then, and thinking about, well, can I apply the current node rule to a capacitor? All right. What you can do is you shouldn't apply the current node rule um, where you think about the um, don't break the capacitor apart. That's the way to apply the current node rule. As long as you think about the capacitor as a single object, and the current coming in and the current coming out, you'll be fine. Okay? If you think about this gap in the middle, then the current node will, rule will, will um, uh, not quite work. We'll actually see later that we need to think, um, well, we need to add a term to what's called Maxwell's equations, but I think that's in a couple of weeks that we'll be able to do that. So as long as you think of your capacitor as a single circuit element, you'll be able to apply the, uh, the current node rule. All right, we're out of time for today, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.